for audio. All right, so I'm going to go ahead and get started. Um, hi, everybody. Thanks for the 40 people who are here now. That's great, great turnout. So um, it's always a great day to have a thesis defense. And I'm really excited about this one. And so I want to introduce to you all Kaya Carrion Bonucci. Um, she grew up in Puerto Rico and spent her life fishing and crewing and traveling aboard boats all across the British US and Spanish Virgin Islands. Um, and really her childhood experiences on the water inspired her to, to create a career um, in marine science. <clears throat> um, she began her undergraduate studies when she was introduced into the world of scientific diving at Florida International University, where she worked in a seagrass ecology lab and gained experience with research diving throughout the Florida Keys National Marine Sanctuary, um, also including the Dry Tortugas. Um, Kaya graduated summa cum laude, which is awesome, with an undergraduate research experience and co-authorship in a paper and also membership into the Phi Beta Kappa Honor Society. So that's awesome. She joined us here at the University of the Virgin Islands and the Masters of Marine and Environmental Science program in 2019, I think, right? Um, her interest in ciguatera poisoning led her to join my lab to pursue a research topic related to ciguatera. Um, she also worked as the ciguatera student research assistant, assistant and expanded her research diving experience. Um, she even became a certified technical diver and has been assisting in multiple research campaigns, which is awesome. Um, at UVI, she's also had a great academic uh, career. She's gained co-authorship once again through her cohort's capstone publication. Um, her thesis research is entitled Ciguatera Toxicity Patterns in Red Hind um, Epinephalus Guttatus on Coral Reefs of St. Thomas, U.S. Virgin Islands. Um, it's really led to some amazing discoveries about ciguatera fish toxicity patterns, which you will hear about today. So I'm joined by her committee members and my dear collaborators, Sarah Heidman from UVI, Mindy Richland from the Woods Hole Oceanographic Institution and Allison Robinson at the Dauphin Island Sea Lab and the University of South Alabama. So without further ado, Kaya, would you please take it away? All right. Awesome. Thank you so much, Tyler, for the introduction. And thank you, everyone, for coming to my thesis defense. Um, I would also like to thank my main advisor, Tyler, and my committee members, Dr. Allison Robertson, Dr. Mindy Richland, and Sarah Heidman. Um, thank you for all of your help throughout this project and for being here today. All right, ciguatoxins are, um, one second, ciguatera poisoning is a foodborne illness caused by the consumption of reef fish contaminated with ciguatoxins. These neurotoxins are produced by benthic dinoflagellates of the genus Gambiardiscus, um, which typically grow on filamentous or macroalgae. And these toxins are transported through the food web and can make humans sick when they consume a contaminated fish. Now, I know there are some people in this call who are new to marine science terminology. So when I say that gambridiscus are benthic organisms, I mean they are growing on the ocean floor as opposed to being pelagic, which means suspended in the water column. And those terms will be important for later in this talk. Ciguatoxins are some of the most potent natural substances known, and they cannot be destroyed by cooking or freezing. Humans can develop uh, gastrointestinal, neurological, and or cardiovascular symptoms that can last for months or sometimes even years. And some of the long-term symptoms include hot-cold sensation reversal, severe weakness, numbness, vertigo, itching, and chills. Most gambridiscus species grow best in warmer water, which is one of the reasons gambridiscus um, one of the reasons ciguatera poisoning is most prevalent in warm environments and tropical reef environments. Because of this, um, it has been assumed that ciguatera incidence will increase with increasing sea surface temperatures. However, that study or that um, correlation has not consistently been established, and some studies have even shown the inverse correlation occurring. Here is a figure from Radke et al. 2013. The authors did a comparative study where they conducted a survey for ciguatera incidents in St. Thomas, U.S. Virgin Islands, and they, compared, and they compared it to a really similar survey that had been done in 1980. And the survey was done in two, 2010 and 2011. This graph is showing the combined results for both surveys depicted in a time series with years on the x-axis. The two y-axes are showing ciguatera incidence on the left and sea surface temperature on the right. 
Uh, the solid black line is showing the estimate of total Ciguatera incidents. Below that, the dashed line is showing the emergency department visits. And the dotted line on the top is showing the sea surface temperature. So contrary to what was expected, although sea surface temperature increased throughout this time period, Ciguatera poisoning declined. And the authors partly attributed that to lower overall fish consumption since 1980, or a higher proportion of low risk fish species being consumed since 1980. Gamber discus produced ciguatoxins, so it makes sense that Radke et al. assumed that more Gamber discus cells would lead to more ciguatera poisoning. But does more Gamber discus equal more ciguatera? The answer is not that simple. So, uh, Zoo et al. 2016 and Kibler et al. 2012 have shown that Gamberdiscus species react differently to various environmental factors, such as temperature, salinity, and irradiance. In addition, Lidecker et al. 2017 showed that Gamberdiscus species vary significantly in toxin production, and they even showed, show a trade-off with slower cell growth rate in exchange for higher toxin production. Studies such as Chenine et al. 1999 and Leifer et al. 2021 showed that Gambridiscus cell abundance did not translate to higher toxicity in a reef. And they even showed a negative correlation between increasing Gambridiscus cell abundance and overall reef toxicity. So it is possible that the discrepancy between uh, ciguatera incidence and sea surface temperature observed by Radke et al. And similarly, the discrepancy between uh, Gambridiscus cell abundance and overall reef toxicity observed by Chenine et al. and Leifer et al. has to do with the presence or absence of a highly toxic Gambridiscus species or strain, or AKA a superbug. And the hypothesis that there might be a superbug driving the toxicity, uh, the overall reef toxicity in a location has now been suggested by multiple authors, such as Holmes et al., Chenine et al., Lidecker et al., Leifer et al., and Rhodes et al. So in the Virgin Islands, the most toxic Gambridiscus species, our superbug, is called Gambridiscus silvae. Um, this, or this is a table I made using, uh, a, or using results, a simplified table I made using results from Lidecker et al. 2017. The uh, toxicity is expressed as femtograms of CTX3C equivalents per cell. Uh, the growth rates are depicted as cell divisions per day. And um, on the bottom there is Gambridiscus silvae. So Gambridiscus silvae is 1,000 times more toxic than the most common Gambridiscus species with the highest growth rate, Gambridiscus carolinianus, um, in, among the species in St. Thomas, U.S. Virgin Islands. Therefore, only a tiny fraction of Gambridiscus silvae cells would be needed to match the overall reef toxicity of a reef dominated by uh, Gambridiscus carolinianus cells. In addition, Zoo et al. 2016 found that Gambridiscus silvae has the lowest tolerance to higher temperature among all the species in the Virgin Islands. And with that in mind, I would think that the fish with the highest toxicity would be in St. Thomas reefs with lower benthic temperature as a result to greater abundance of Gambridiscus silvae cells. To me, that explained why Radke et al. saw a decrease in ciguatera poisoning with increasing sea surface temperature. And it explains why Leifer et al. 2021 found that in St. Thomas, um, the overall reef toxicity was greatest in the cooler months of the year. But there are more parts to this story and um, we can't guess fish toxicity by talking about Gambier discus alone and not talking about fish. So enough about Gambier discus, let's talk about fish. Most of the tropical reef fishes responsible for ciguatera poisoning in humans are higher trophic level reef fishes, such as barracudas, jacks, snappers, and groupers. Although no reliable test to measure toxicity of fishes directly in the field exists, um, there are laboratory analyses, such as the Neuro2A or N2A assay, that are used to detect the concentration and presence of ciguatoxins and fish tissues, usually from muscle or liver samples. 
But again, the story is incomplete with Gambrodiscus toxicity on its own. And since there are endless possible food chain interactions, how can we determine the ciguatoxin transport from a Gambrodiscus all the way up to a carnivorous fish? It's also uncertain whether the toxins detected in a fish tissue originated from the reef where it was captured. However, through stable isotope analyses, it is possible to study the dietary differences of fishes with different tissue toxin concentrations, and stable isotope analyses can be an effective method to explore links between fishes and their habitats. Nitrogen isotope ratios become enriched with trophic transfers and can help identify the trophic level of an organism. In this diagram, you can see that with each trophic transfer, nitrogen isotopes uh, delta values fractionate or increase at about three per mil per trophic level. The primary producers have the lowest value at about one per mil, primary and secondary consumers are closer to six per mil, and top predators are often about 13 per mil. Carbon isotope ratios um, are highly variable among organisms with different dietary sources of primary producers. And carbon isotopes um, are, show, do not change very much with trophic transfers. Therefore, carbon isotopes are used to identify basal carbon sources in an organism's food chain. In other words, what is the plant source of that organism's food chain? Is it a benthic plant or is it a pelagic plant? So bringing this back to ciguatoxins, you can see how in addition to identifying the reefs with the best conditions for the most toxic Gambrodiscus species, which in our case is Gambrodiscus silvae, we need to make sure that the food web dynamics in each location allow those benthic originating ciguatoxins to be transported up the food chain. In this diagram, a benthic toxin would be transported much more efficiently in the fish on the food web to the right, for example. Um, but when it comes to figuring out concentration, ciguatoxin concentration in fishes, there are other, co other covariates to consider, such as fish size. So the food chain hypothesis, which was first suggested by Randall in 1958, states that larger fish are more likely to contain a higher concentration of ciguatoxins than smaller sized fish of the same species. For example, Chan et al. 2011 found a positive correlation between ciguatoxin concentration and the weight of moray eels from the South Pacific, but studies have been inconsistent in supporting the food chain hypothesis. O'Toole et al. 2012 found no correlation between ciguatoxin concentration and the length of barracudas captured off Cape Eleuthera in the Bahamas, and Gaboriau et al. in 2014, or Gaboriau et al. 2014 in French Polynesia did not find a correlation between uh, the proportion of toxic fishes within a family and the length of those fishes. The fish species that I chose for my thesis is red hind groupers, so let's talk about them. Red hind are among the top five commercially important fish species in the U.S. Virgin Islands and Puerto Rico. In 2000, a marine conservation district was established south of St. Thomas, and it protects important spawning aggregations of red hind groupers. According to Nemeth 2005, because of this, red hind in deep water south of St. Thomas have increased in length and weight, and fish stocks have improved throughout the region. Red hind are protogynous sequential hermaphrodites with females reaching maturity at about 20 centimeters and transitioning to males at about 32 to 38 centimeters. Randall 1967 reported the stomach contents from 110 red hind captured by spearfishing in the US Virgin Islands and Puerto Rico. And the stomach contents included crabs, stomatopods, shrimp, octopus, and various fishes. Fish species included yellow goatfish, boga, small parrot fishes, and orange spotted filefish. So I decided to choose red hind as my main study species for multiple reasons. Number one, I thought doing statistical analysis with one fish species would be better than multiple species in terms of replication and validity of our results. 
After reviewing the literature, I discovered that having so many fish of the same species tested for ciguatoxin content is actually quite rare and makes this study unique. The second reason is red hind are known to be site attached. Therefore, it made it easier to link the ciguatoxin content with environmental factors within a location for this species compared to a highly mobile species like a jack or a snapper, for example. The third reason is that red hind are commercially important, therefore increasing the importance of our results in terms of human health concerns. And finally, the fourth reason for choosing this species is that I've been fishing red hind my entire life, so I felt comfortable and confident in my proposed methods. So on to my methods. To give a brief overview of what we did, we captured red hind in five, five different St. Thomas reefs. We used benthic temperature as a proxy for Gambrodiscus species composition. We used staple isotope analysis and uh, fish population data to explore dietary differences of red hind among these sites. And most importantly, we tested each red hind for the presence and concentration of ciguatoxins in their tissues. Our research questions were, one, is there a difference in ciguaterotoxicity in red hind tissue samples among sites? Two, is there a relationship between red hind size and toxicity? And three, is there a difference in stable isotope values of red hind among sites or among fish with different tissue toxin concentrations? So here are study sites. Um, this is a map of St. Thomas, US Virgin Islands. The stars represent the locations where red hind were captured in June and July of 2020. The site depth is in meters next to the site name. And these sites were selected to be the same as ongoing monitoring sites where algal samples are being collected for Gambrodiscus species counts and identification. That project is in progress and led by Dr. Mindy Richland and Dr. Donald Anderson in Woods Hole Oceanographic Institute. These sites are also used by the Territorial Coral Reef Monitoring Program, or TCRIM, where coral health and fish population surveys are conducted on permanent transects. The fish population data were useful for this project to explore dietary differences in red hind based on the available prey fish or the small fishes found in each of these locations. Benthic temperature data were uh, used as a proxy for Gambrodiscus species composition. These data were obtained through TCRIMP, where hobo temperature loggers are deployed and tied to a fixed site marker and left in each site for one year. The most fun part of this project was definitely the fishing, mostly between me and my dad, who helped considerably with field work. We obtained 96 red hind in June and July of 2020 using baited hook and line on a rod and reel. We collected 20 red hind per site, with the exception of two sites, where due to timing and budget constraints, 18 fish were collected from those two sites. Previously, frozen store-bought squid was used as bait. We did get a few non-target species, which was inevitable, and uh, those were released as quickly as possible. But the, and the few more delicious of those non-target species were definitely not filleted and brought back to my apartment, nor eaten with plantains, rice, and beans. So prior to freezing, the length and weight of each red hind was measured to the nearest millimeter and gram, respectively. On shore, the muscle tissues were surgically removed, lightly rinsed with fresh water, labeled, double bagged, and frozen. Uh, after that, I went to Dolphin Island Sea Lab and the University of South Alabama, along with my dog, Waldo, and my boyfriend, Chris, who kept me company and were so supportive in the three months that I was there. In Alabama, I met with my committee member, Dr. Allison Robertson, and her amazing lab members, who trained me on fish toxicity analysis techniques and helped me obtain and interpret the red hind toxicity results. In Alabama, before doing the N2A assay, I did ciguatoxin extractions from all of our fish tissues to isolate any ciguatoxins that may be present and to clean the extract to get rid of compounds that could interfere with the N2A assay. These are also known as matrix compounds. N2A cells are mouse neuroblastoma cell lines that are used to detect sodium channel neurotoxins, such as ciguatoxins, 
based on how they respond to being treated with the ciguatoxin extract from our fish tissues. This is a three-day assay where on the first day, a known quantity of N2A cells are introduced into a 96 well plate and left in an incubator to grow for a day. That's called cell seeding. On the second day, the seeded plates are dosed with our ciguatoxin extracts from our fish. That's called dosing. And the dose plates are left in the incubator once again for a day to allow them to, to respond to any ciguatoxins that may have been present in the sample. And then on the third day, you obtain results using the MTT colorimetric test. It's called developing. MTT tells you how many cells are still alive based on the mitochondrial activity in live cells, which reduces MTT to a purple formazan product. So the darker purple means the cells are still alive. And then the lighter the color, the greater the cell mortality, and hence the greater the toxicity in your sample. So for every assay day, I had a control plate and at least one standard plate of a known ciguatoxin standard. In this case, we used the ciguatoxin congener PCTX3C. So to calculate toxicity in our sample, we compared the mortality response from our sample plate to the dose response curve from the standard plate. And then toxicity of our sample is therefore expressed as equivalence of the standard. So after toxicity analysis, we prepared subsamples from all of our fish for stable isotope analyses. Subsamples were freeze dried, pulverized, placed into tin capsules, and shipped to UC Berkeley for analysis. And to complement the stable isotope results, we used data from TCRIM 2020 fish surveys for fishes sized only up to 10 centimeters in length, as we believe those are more likely to be eaten. Um, and then those little fishies were categorized as herbivore, planktivore, invertivore, piscivore, or omnivore based on Randall 1967. And finally, we get to see and talk about our results. So if you remember from my introduction, benthic temperature can give us some insight into gambrodiscus community compositions among these sites. Here's a box plot showing daily average temperature among sites for one year with temperature on the y-axis and sites on the x-axis. Uh, depth is in meters next to the site name and the letters above the box indicate significant differences in a post hoc done test. Um, mean annual temperature was significantly different among sites and benthic temperature decreased with depth and distance from shore. So based only on these data, I would expect the fish to be most toxic in the offshore deep sites, Gramonic Tiger, and Hindbank East where the temperature is cooler and vice versa because Gambrodiscus sylvae, our most toxic species, prefers those cooler conditions. But again, we should consider the differences in or the, the food web dynamics in each of these locations to explore the potential transport of ciguatoxin from a Gambrodiscus to a red hind. So let's investigate the stable isotope analysis. This is a biplot for stable isotope um, delta values of red hind tissue samples. The sites are color coded and circled by ellipses. Black point is red, seahorse is blue, South Capel is pink, and the two cream colors are the offshore deep sites, Vermonic Tiger and Hindbank East. If you remember from my introduction, nitrogen isotopes tell us about the trophic level of an organism. And carbon isotopes can tell us about the basal carbon source or the source of primary production in the organism's food chain. When we look at nitrogen, uh, the delta values for all of our fish samples were below nine per mil, which is much lower than we expected and suggests that these red hind were mostly feeding on primary consumers. So they have a pretty short food chain. Um, as for carbon, that's where it gets interesting. The lower carbon isotope delta values for the, the more negative uh, values for the fish at the offshore deep sites, Vermonic Tiger and Hindbank East, suggest a basal carbon source that is dominated by pelagic phytoplankton, while the higher carbon isotope delta values in the fish from the other three sites, Black Point Seahorse and South Capella, suggest a benthic algal source. This suggests that fish in the offshore deep sites were mostly feeding on planktivores, while fish in the other sites had a higher proportion of benthic grazers in their diets. 
Therefore, even if Gramonic tiger and hindbank yeast were loaded with Gambriodiscus silvae cells, if, if um, the red hind and these sites are feeding on planktivores, then ciguatoxins originating from Gambriodiscus, a benthic dinoflagellate, will not be transported up the food chain as efficiently as a site with a higher availability of benthic grazing prey. And these um, stable isotope results match the T. cramp fish population data. So these are these figures were generated using data from T. cramp fish surveys from 2020, where uh, fish surveys are conducted on permanent transects and fishes are categorized, sized and categorized into five centimeter increments. Once again, we only used fish data for fishes sized up to 10 centimeters in length, since we believe those are more likely to be preyed upon by red hind. Uh, here, the pie charts are showing percent abundance of trophic groups for available prey fish. Black point, um, sorry, herbivores are in green, planktivores in blue, invertivores are in orange, piscivores in yellow, and omnivores are in gray. And then on the right, I'm showing a table with absolute biomass of herbivores among all the sites. So you can see how the uh, fish population data match what the stable isotopes were telling us. The available prey fish at the offshore deep sites, Vermonic Tiger and Hindbank East, are dominated by planktivores with very few herbivores. Here is a linear regression comparing the carbon isotope delta values of red hind tissue samples on the y-axis to the percent abundance ratio of planktivore to herbivore uh, for available prey fish at each of the sites, and sites are color-coded. So although there are only five uh, ratios for planktivore to herbivore of available prey fish, because there are only five sites, you can see that there's a strong negative relationship between the carbon isotope uh, values of red hind tissues and the relative abundance of planktivores among sites. As the relative abundance of planktivores increases, the carbon isotope value decreases. The fact that there's such a clear relationship between these two data sets suggests that the available prey fish at these sites are significantly influencing the diets of red hind. So it makes sense that they're likely influencing their toxicity as well. But remember, um, the search for covariates is incomplete since we already learned that fish size might also drive the toxicity and red hind sizes were significantly different among these sites. Here is a box plot showing red hind weight among sites with weight on the y-axis and sites on the x-axis. The site depth is in meters next to the site name, and the letters above the box indicate significant differences in a post hoc done test. Juvenile red hind typically settle near shore and then they move offshore as they age. So as we expected, red hind size increased with depth and distance from shore. We thought that these size differences might influence the toxicity results because the fish at Gramonic Tiger and Hindbank East were so much larger than the fish at the other three sites. And I'm sure you would love to know if how all of these covariates did or did not affect the toxicity results. So it's time to complete the story and get to the part that everyone's been waiting for. What were the toxicity results? So I'll start with overall fish toxicity. Um, red hind uh, toxicity analyses using the N2A assay revealed that 83% of the 96 fish tested had detectable levels of ciguatoxins. In addition, 66% of red hind tested had ciguatoxin concentrations above 0.31 parts per billion of PCTX3C equivalents, which is the toxicity safety threshold established by Chennine et al. 2010. And before I show the rest of my results, I wanted to talk about this one fish since he was such a big outlier in this study, and I will be referring to him in the next few slides. It may be a coincidence, but the largest fish I caught overall and possibly the largest red hind I had ever seen also happened to be the most toxic fish by a whole lot. I decided to call him BTF, which stands for Big Toxic Fish. If you remember from my introduction, the food chain hypothesis states that larger fish are more likely to contain higher concentration of ciguatoxins than smaller fish. 
When you look at this super large toxic fish, it seems like that hypothesis is correct. But when we see how he compares to the rest of the fish in the study, you might begin to think it actually was a coincidence. The next most toxic fish was also captured in South Capella, but that fish weighed less than half a pound, while BTF weighed over three and a half pounds. The next largest fish was captured in Hindbank East, and that fish weighed close to three pounds, but that fish was not toxic. So I think BTF is freakishly toxic because of where he came from and not because of his large size. And as you will see from here on out, my results suggest exactly that. Toxicity appears to be determined by site-specific differences and not fish size. So comparisons of toxicity and size were slightly significant only when BTF was included in the analysis. When BTF was excluded, there was no relationship between size and toxicity among sites and within every site. Here I'm showing linear regressions with toxicity on the y-axis and weight on the x-axis. The figure on the left is showing all fish and the figure of the, on the right is just an example of uh, one site, a uh, gramonic tiger. So on the left, the red line is including BTF and the blue line is without BTF. And you can see how even with BTF, which is circled in red on the top far right corner, there, the slope of the line is small and the line is nearly horizontal. And without BTF, that line is pretty much completely horizontal. Similarly, on the right, although there is a large distribution of fish sizes within the site Gramonic Tiger, there's no relationship between toxicity and size. So although BTF was the largest and most toxic fish, it really doesn't seem like size is driving toxicity since some of the smaller fish tested were also the most toxic. And finally, this is what I believe to be my most important figure in this study. Here is a box plot showing the, the ciguatoxin content in red hind among sites. Ciguatoxin content is expressed as micrograms of PCTX3C equivalents per kilogram of fish tissue on the y-axis. On the x-axis, RMI sites and depth is depicted in meters next to the site name. The letters above the box indicate significant differences in a post hoc done test and that red line is indicating the toxicity safety thres threshold based on Chennine et al. 2010. And before I get to the interpretation of this, I just want to note that BTF has been removed from this figure to improve the visual scale. However, the crucible wallace tests, including and excluding this outlier fish, showed the exact same trends. And if you're curious about where he should fall, his toxicity was above eight micrograms of PCTX3C equivalents per kilogram of fish tissue. So um, mean toxicity of, uh, of red hind tissue samples was significantly different among sites. Mean toxicity was greatest in fish captured at South Capella compared to all other sites and lowest at Black Point compared to all other sites. The conditions driving fish toxicity are complex and determined by multiple, multiple confounding variables, but there appear to be two key elements. Number one, conditions favorable for the most toxic Gambridiscus species in the region. In our case, that was Gambridiscus silvae. And number two, a high abundance of benthic grazers as available prey, which facilitates the transport of a benthic toxin up the food web. I think those two variables are what best explain the toxicity patterns observed in this box plot. And we can look at this box plot again based on those two variables depicted in a Venn diagram where the sites with the highest overlap of those two variables result in the greatest toxicity. So let me explain. Black Point was my least toxic site. It had the highest abundance of benthic grazers as available prey, but the least favorable condition for Gambridiscus silvae presence based on its higher temperature. Gramonic tiger and Hindbank East had the most favorable conditions for Gambridiscus silvae presence based on the lower temperature, but it had a very low abundance of benthic grazers as available prey. Seahorse and South Capella being somewhere in the middle of everything may have both Gambridiscus silvae presence and benthic grazers as available prey, 
which may explain why the fish in these sites were so much more toxic. So to wrap up this talk, I wanted to briefly summarize the key findings of this thesis. Number one, results from the study suggest that toxicity of red hind is driven by site-specific differences and not fish size. Number two, it's important to consider both the differences in toxin production of gambardiscus species, as well as the food web dynamics of toxic fishes, of potentially toxic fishes. And three, red hind in the US Virgin Islands are more frequently toxic than previously thought and may contribute to ciguatera poisoning in people who consume this fish species. But with that last point, I do want to mention, um, although 83% of our fish had detectable levels of ciguatoxin and 66% exceeded the safety threshold, I'm not saying that 66% of these fish would definitely make someone sick or symptomatic with ciguatera poisoning. These safety guidelines are conservative and sensitivity to ciguatoxins vary from person to person. For example, People who consume a lot of fish or people who have previously had ciguatera poisoning are thought to be at greater risk. Many of the fish tested were near the threshold. And after this, after this thesis, I have a strong feeling that I've probably eaten fish at or slightly above the threshold. But that being said, there were some fish, mostly from South Capella, that had incredibly high toxin concentrations. And I would not recommend eating those super toxic fish to anyone. It's finding those kinds of trends and identifying the reasoning behind these trends that can help save consumers all over tropical reef environments from this debilitating neurological illness, especially for people living in regions with a strong economic reliance on local fisheries, such as the US Virgin Islands and my home island. I was born and raised in Puerto Rico and grew up fishing and around fishermen, mostly from Culebra Island. This is one of the reasons I have such a strong connection to this project. I also had a very serious case of ciguatera poisoning when I was a seventh grade kid. On top of that, my father has had ciguatera and my mother has had it three times, but no one will ever convince me or my family to stop fishing or eating fish. So the best way to continue doing so safely is by advancing the research necessary and discovering more ciguatera toxicity patterns as the ones I just presented here and discovered throughout my master's journey. Also, something I find so interesting from my results is that they make sense based on my personal ciguatera story. When I was a kid, I used to eat, I used to eat dozens and dozens of small barracudas that I used to fish along Ensenada Onda in Culebra Island. And I thought they were, I thought these small barracudas were safe because they were small. And then I went on a family boat trip to Virgin Gorda and I fished a small barracuda that I thought was safe because it was small and it looked identical to the hundreds that I had eaten in Culebra. But that fish wasn't from Culebra, it was captured miles away and it happened to be the one fish that got me sick, but probably the one fish that sparked my interest in ciguatera poisoning and led to the main discoveries of this thesis project. An exciting part of this study is that it was conducted in sites with long-term monitoring of both coral reef ecology and gambrodiscus community compositions. Therefore, red hind toxicity results can help complement future studies conducted in the same locations, increasing the potential to answer many ecological questions relating to the transport of ciguatoxins through the food chain. And hopefully that can help prevent future cases of ciguatera poisoning and humans who consume fish throughout the territory. I would like to thank my main advisor and committee members, Dr. Tyler Smith, Dr. Allison Robertson, Dr. Mindy Richland, and Sarah Heidman. Completion of this thesis would not have been possible without your help and support. I would like to thank Allison and her awesome lab members for their incredible hospitality and for training me in toxicity analysis methods. Um, I would like to thank Dr. Rick Nemeth, Sean Cadison, Danielle Olive, and Jason Cattell for helping me with fishing and obtaining the fishing permits to make this project possible. I would like to thank my boyfriend, Chris, for, um, <laughs> for helping me with fishing, for traveling with me to Alabama, for reading multiple thesis drafts, and for being so supportive of me and patient throughout this entire master's journey. I would like to thank Chris's parents, Tom and Linda, for helping me with travel logistics 
and for being so supportive of me. I would like to thank my dog, Waldo, for always keeping a smile on my face and just for being awesome. And finally, I would like to thank my parents, Alberto and Yvonne, for, gosh, who inspired me to become a marine biologist and have always been so supportive in everything that I do. I would especially like to thank my father for traveling to St. Thomas to help with fishing. I don't think I know anyone else who can say, for my thesis, I went fishing with my dad. So I really couldn't have done it without all of you. Thank you so much. Muchas gracias. Here are my references, and I will now take any questions. Great, thank you, Kaya. I hope you guys can hear me. Um, yeah, so anyone wants to jump in with questions, feel free. Um, I can try and quarterback that. And then for the committee, I should mention, we'll have a chance to have a private meeting with Kaya after this um, to ask any more specific questions. I think a few people are raising their hands. I'm not sure who, I don't, I, I don't see a name on the square, so I'm not sure who is who. <laughs> Maybe just unmute yourself and ask. Get it out or write it in the chat and I can call you up. Um, good afternoon, Kaya. Um, thank you. Uh, it was a nice presentation and great information. Um, I have a question in regards to what do you think of um, species that are at uh, a lower level, trophic, trophic level, um, like um, scallops? What do you think um, they will also have these huge uh, amounts of cigotoxins? Sure, that's, that's a great question. Um, so there has been uh, identification of ciguatoxins in organisms that aren't fish. That's why in the past, ciguatera poisoning used to be called ciguatera fish poisoning, but there have been studies that have shown toxicity in invertebrates, like lobsters and, and other invertebrates. So that's why the term has now changed from ciguatera fish poisoning to just ciguatera poisoning to include those organisms. And, and there have been some pretty low trophic level fishes that have been identified to have high toxin loads. Like damsel fishes can have a lot of toxin loads. So I really do think that it might not be, we're sort of driving away from the food chain hypothesis and like large fish and bioaccumulation. And I think it mostly has to do with the environmental factors and you know what toxic spe what super toxic species is there. If the ciguatoxin is there and organisms are eating, that toxin, then they're gonna have the toxin in them. And the second question is, this fish, um, if I'm not wrong, you, you uh, catch them in summer, right? Yeah. Would you expect any difference uh, if you catch them in, you know, like in winter? Yeah, that's a great question. So I think one of the reasons I had such a strong signal was because I caught the fish in a pretty short amount of time. Um, so they were all ca captured around the same, like just two months. Um, but there have been studies showing seasonality of toxicity, like that study Life for It All 2021 that was just that was just published this year, found that um, overall reef toxicity, not not in fishes, just overall reef toxicity produced by Gambrodiscus, changes with se has seasonality. So in the winter, the um, toxicity was greater greater. And in the summer, it was less. So I there that would be a great follow-up study and something that I would be completely interested in is how would these results change had we fished in a different time of the year? Okay, thank you. Uh, hi, yeah, this is Maricel Tan. Um, hey, so I still curious about your, you know, the hypothesis of the size versus the 
toxicity. And I was wondering if you were to extend your studies, where would you go with that? I mean, I know it's always hard to to harvest on the or fish in your case on the extremes, no? Because you, you're gonna need a lot of large fish. Or is it going to other species? One solution to to look more into this. Or what what are your thoughts on that? About the size of other species. Right. Yeah. Your no about the the hypothesis of size versus uh, toxicity. And the, I mean, you're showing that. To me, one of the most interesting results is that you're showing that a small fish could have a very high toxicity, and that kind of your plot. You, yeah. So the, there are several things on that. One is it's hard to 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 sample on the extreme values of the you know, large fish because by definition you usually don't have too much. And then the other thing is, uh, so how how would you go about you know if if you were to follow up on that, would you go to other species and see maybe if you can fish a uh, large fish or you just try to, to do more sampling here? Or what, what are your thoughts on that, uh, on that aspect? So of course, a larger number of fish will lead to statistical results. Uh, I think we had a pretty high end Amount, large number of uh, red pine, and um, our results from this big toxic fish. It really doesn't show that there's such a big correlation. Like this, this is a toxic fish. This is a tiny fish. This is a very small fish. Um, so I think with red pine in particular, at least in the Virgin Islands, it, I don't think it's correlated with size at all. But it's possible that um, other species might do a correlation. Uh, there have been studies that have shown a correlation between size and toxicity. So, you know, it's possible, but my results and a lot of other papers don't support that hypothesis. No. Yeah. Great job, by the way. Excellent presentation. Thank you. And Kai, I see a question here in the, um, in the chat from Nicole Vandertuen. Um, she asked, awesome job, Kaya. Can you please share which categories of prey fish live in benthic versus pelagic settings? It sounded like there's a lot, there's a correlation, but that multiple of the categories live in each. For example, do planktivores and herbivores both live in benthic and pelagic settings with different concentrations or are the herbivores mostly benthic? Okay, um, so planktivore, means that it's fishing, that it's eating in the water column. Benthic means that it's feeding in the bottom. So I would, it's most of the herbivores are definitely more benthic. Um, they're feeding off of macroalgae in the bottom. Um, but there can be planktivores next to an herbivore. Just because it's a planktivore doesn't mean it has to go up all the way to the surface and be like way far away from, um, from the bottom of the seafloor. It's just differences in feeding habits. So a planktivore can be like a, like let's, an herbivore fish that everyone knows is a parrotfish, right? And a parrotfish can be grazing on the bottom. And next to a parrotfish at the bottom, there could be a planktivore, like a little blue chromis, that's just feeding differently. It's just grabbing little plankton in the water column instead of grazing on the bottom. So they can be in the same locations. It just so happened that our results show a very strong, um, a very significant difference in the in the types of fishes that live in these different uh, locations. So, Gramonic Tiger and Hindbank East are those two offshore deep deep sites, and it makes sense that they have more herbivores. Sorry, that if they have more planktivores as available prey because of the conditions in that site. It's a wall site, so wall locations tend to um, have some upwelling and upwelling comes with a lot of nutrients and productivity and plankton and planktivores that will feed there versus like um, Black Point had the most herbivores and there's not any upwelling going on there. There's not that much plankton activity compared to the offshore sites. So it's a lot of herbivores living in that region. Got it. Thank you so much.
Okay, well, if there are not any further questions, we're getting close to an hour. So I think that's a good point to say um, thank you to everyone who came to see Kaya's thesis. Um, I'm very glad that you've joined us. And um, we wanna just all unmute and give her a round of applause. And then we'll retire after about five minutes. Um, we'll retire with the closed committee meeting and uh, do that. Thank you. Wow. Show yourself too, that's nice.